Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. What's up? What's up? What is up? Back once again, it is the incredible in the black podcast. And in case you weren't aware, this is a podcast dedicated to covering the current events and social issues going on in your black world and covering it all from the perspective of three grown ass men who know that real recognizes real. I am your host, Big O, Mr. In the Black himself. And I want to welcome you to another special episode of The Black Light. The Black Light is our opportunity to dive deep into the people and conversations that deserve a lot more time and that need the deep dive. But you know I cannot do this alone. Let me introduce the rest of let me Come introduce on, the rest of NSYNC, bro. It's NSYNC tonight. It's NSYNC, uh, NSYNC bro. <laughs> bro. All right, new edition. My bad. I apologize. New edition. Locks. We Is that good? State property. I just said new edition. Are you going to take that? New not? edition. I'm Johnny Gill. Oh. <laughs> just so you know, I'm Johnny. Boogie, say what's, <laughs> Boogie, say what's, what's up, good, man? family. How y'all doing out there? Yes, indeed. And if you love content like this, please make sure to follow us on social media at in the black pdcst on facebook twitter and instagram and if you're checking us out on youtube make sure you smash that thumbs up button and subscribe so that you don't miss out on the next video um this evening i am extremely happy we have a very special guest tonight many of you may know him from his many appearances on msnbc but let's take a quick look at uh let's take a quick look you know, America's not unique in its sins hmm. as a country. We're not unique in our evils, to be honest with you. Um, I think where we, where we may be singular is our fu- a refusal to acknowledge them hmm. Hmm. and the legends and myths we tell about our inherent, you know, goodness uh, to hide and cover and conceal so that we can maintain a kind of willful ignorance that protects our innocence. Sure. See, the thing is, is this, and I'll say this and I'll take the hit on it. There are communities that have had to bear the brunt of America confronting, white Americans confronting the danger of their innocence. And it happens every generation. So somehow we have to kind of, oh my God, is this who we are? And just again, another, here's another generation of babies. And so what we know is that the country has been playing politics for a long time on this hatred. We know this. So it's easy for us to place it all on Donald Trump's shoulders. It's easy for us to place Pittsburgh on his shoulders. It's easy for me to place Charlottesville on his shoulders. It's easy for us to place El Paso on his shoulders. This is us. And if we're going to get past this, we can't blame it on him. He's a manifestation of the ugliness that's in us. I've had the privilege of growing up in a tradition that didn't believe in the myths and the legends because we had to bear the brunt of them. Either we're going to change, Nicole, or we're going to do this again and again, and babies are going to have to grow up without mothers and fathers, uncles and aunts, friends, while we're trying to convince white folk to finally leave behind a history that will maybe, maybe, or embrace a history that might set them free from being white. (laughs) He's probably one of the most notable names and faces in black media. And when he's not writing a best-selling book, like his newest work, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own, you can find him on MSNBC, Speaking Truth to Power, Please help me welcome Professor Eddie Glaude. Professor Glaude, thank you. We really What's appreciate you taking, taking the time out. Of course, of course. And I don't have a tie on, you know, so this yes. is good. Yes, <laughs> be loose, brother, be loose. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Um, most of our listeners are probably very entrenched in who Baldwin is, the literature, and have a deep understanding of probably who you are. But another portion of our listeners also probably just come to us for news and current events. So for their sake, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, I'm a country boy from Mississippi, a Morehouse man to the core, uh, graduate class in 1989, you know, um, and uh, did my PhD at Princeton. I'm the chair of the Department of African-American Studies at Princeton. 
Uh, and James S. McDonald, Distinguished University Professor. That's a that's a fancy title, but you know you earn it. You might as well use it. Hey, yes, indeed. Um, uh, so, uh, and I tend to uh, work in and around the areas of African American religion and politics. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the core of my, my my scholarship. And as of late, I've had an opportunity to be able to have an impact on the public conversation around race and democracy in the country. Yes, indeed. Now, we want to jump into the book because it's a powerful book. Man. The book comes across to me as a, a tough reflection. Well, aside from that, an ode to James Baldwin, but also a tough reflection on our current status in America. Um, yeah. for, for those people that aren't familiar, in your words, how would you describe Baldwin? And then my second part to that question is, uh, why did you think that it was important to write this book yeah. through Baldwin's lens? Why specifically yeah. that? So I think Baldwin, you know, thanks for the question because I think it's a really important one. You know, Baldwin is perhaps one of the most insightful, it's not even a perhaps, he's one of the most insightful uh, American writers about uh, democracy and about race. Uh, he is an artist extraordinaire, uh, a novelist, a playwright, an essayist, uh, and, and, and more importantly, at least for me, uh, uh, a, an extraordinary critic of the contradictions at the heart of the country. You know, a brother born in, 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 in po poverty in Harlem who dies in France, you know, August 2nd of 1924, December 1st of 1987, between womb and tomb, mm. uh, uh, he, he left us a corpus to really understand how, how crazed and how complicated uh, this country actually is. Um, and so I decided, you know, I've been working, I've been writing with Jimmy, reading Jimmy for, and I call him Jimmy because he's his close partner of mine, in my head at least. Um, I've, been, I've, been, I've been walking with him for about 30 years. And, and because he, I've been grappling with his ideas, at least in the background of my scholarship, I decided that it was time to bring him on stage to kind of think with him. Uh, not to write about him, but to think with him, because, you know, the book is centered around the latter part of Baldwin's career. Sure, sure. Uh, period when he seems to be, at least according to some folks, angry. Uh, <laughs> an old man has gone bad in the teeth, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to figure out how he balanced his rage and his faith, because I was feeling like my rage was overwhelming me, like, that, like my despair was overwhelming me. So that was at the heart of the reason why I wanted to write uh, with Jimmy about this current moment, right? So it's because he's a walking partner and I think he has something for us to, something to say to us now yeah, yeah. Um, as we grapple with this craziness that we're grappling with. Uh, Doc, let me ask you this because as I'm reading the book, uh, I have a little bit of a, uh, a understanding of, of James Baldwin. One of the things that I always identified with him was his struggles with faith traditions. Yeah. Uh, the way he wrestled with certain components of the Christian faith specifically. But as I'm reading this book, the thing that I struggled with is it seemed like towards the latter part of his life, hope was something that he still was trying to reconcile with, mm. that he was still trying to gain an understanding of. And in many instances, it seemed like he was looking for hope, not only for himself, but specifically for the Black people that he loved. With that component, where did you find yourself at? Where do you find yourself now at with hope in this climate, everything that's taking place? How do you find hope? How do you define hope for Black America? You know, that's a wonderful question. And there's this cold line Jimmy uses. He says, hope is invented every day. Ooh. So it's not something that just exists out there. Hope is invented every day. It's not just simply a noun. Hope is a verb. It's an action verb. It's something that we do. It's evidenced in how we move through space and time. Sure, sure, sure. So, so finding hope uh, for us today is 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 kind of rooted in our attachments and our love for our, our, our families and our love for our children and in, 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 a, in a sense of trying to build a better world for them. 
Mm. So you think about it. I, I wrote this. I'm a, I'm a scholar of religion, and I was thinking about this within the context of, of slavery. There's mm. nothing in the condition of, of being enslaved that would lead you that your condition would be better. Yes. There's, yes. there's yes. nothing about the existence of being an enslaved person yes. that leads you to believe yes. that you will have a life other than what you're currently yes, living. Absolutely. Mm. But you can find hope when you look in the eyes of someone that you love. Mm. And you see, even in that condition, her eyes glimmers when she looks at you. Mm. Or you can find hope in that moment when you see the innocence of your child, however brief. Yeah, yeah. Right. What can I do? How can I how can I work to make her life better, his life Ooh. better? And so it's not a it's not a hope rooted in something that's in the far off distance. It's yeah, a hope yeah. rooted in our current attachment. But you know, it's also a blue soaked hope. And this is a line that comes from Du Bois's uh Souls of Black Folk mm -hmm. uh in, in, in his uh elegy to his son. Du Bois writes. It's a hope, not hopeless, but unhopeful. Ooh. See, that's a blue so hope. That's a, like a B.B. King line, like nobody loves me but my mama and she could be lying too. That mm. improvis improvisational hope, I see it. Exactly, so hope is invented every day. It's invented in the face of evil. It's invented in the face of cruelty. It's invented in the face of barbarity, right? It's, in the, in, it's invented in the face of darkness when it doesn't look like there's anything else in front of you. What does it mean? Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Ooh. Where does that come from? Mm, 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 mm. You feel me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I need All right, so, so, so my question to you is, how could you ultimately write a book filled with hope when the argument from many writers about Baldwin is that when he left to go to France that he was given up? Yeah. So how do you how do you balance that? Because I found it in in his in 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 his work, right? So you know, there's this he's always telling people, you know, look in the ruins. Mm -hmm. Right? Of of my life, right? Look in the ruins and there you might find something useful. And so um I was trying to 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 figure out. Okay, now how did he pick up the pieces? Because you know the most important book of nonfiction for me that he ever wrote was um, No Name in the Street, written in 1972. Mm -hmm. Not Fire Next Time, but mm -hmm. this 1972 text. And the reason why it's the most important book for me is because it's the first book he writes after King's assassination. Mm. Okay. So Baldwin collapses after King is murdered. Mm. He's like they killed him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They murdered an apostle of love. Mm. And so he basically collapses, the relationship falls apart, you know, um, and, and he tries to commit suicide in 1969. And then, you know, he, he's working, trying to figure out how to recount what has happened in this compressed time, what has happened since Brown v. Board and the Montgomery, the Montgomery bus boycott, the student sit-ins, the March on Washington, right? What has happened, right, in these, con it, you know, to the point to where now, Nixon has been elected in 68 yeah, yeah, yeah. and he sees Ronald Reagan on the horizon, right? What is mm. happening? So he's trying to figure this out. So no name in the street is how he picks up the pieces. So mm. it's a book, it's a book that is structured like trauma. Mm. So as I'm reading him, I'm still seeing him reaching for this better possibility, rageful, angry, not naive about the capacity of white folks. He's actually changed, you know, Michael Thelwell, the, the professor at um, University of Massachusetts Amherst, who was a who was a member of NAG, the Nonviolent Action Group at Howard, who became a critical feature, a critical uh, participant in SNCC, said, when we think about the later Jimmy, the nature of his we changed. And I was like, what you mean the nature of his we changed? He said, he wasn't talking to white folks. He realized that our task is not to save them. So, so he shifts his attention, and you can see that shift in attention in No Name in the Streets. You can see it in If Bill Street Could Talk. You can see it in yep. Just Above My Head. You can see the devil finds work. You can see it in the evidence of things not seen. And he's still finding hope there. So you got to look in the ruins, Dang. right? You got to look in the ruins. He did not succumb to despair. Not at all. Not at all. Hmm. Now, uh, go ahead. <clears throat> no, no, go ahead, man. No, because the one component that I go back to when I think of Mr. Baldwin is how he never 
try to suppress his anger with the current state of affairs. Yeah. Like he wore that as a badge of honor. Like I'm walking in this room, little Negro, but I'm angry as hell and I'm going to express that component. Uh, when you were writing that, how did you suppress your own frustration? Because you're in the middle of the Trump era with all this going on, rage filled. How did you suppress? How do you suppress your own rage in the midst of all this? Well, I, I don't. You know, mm. I, I write in the book, I say, this shit will drive you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I say that. I wrote that sentence, <clears throat> you know, um, and. Um, you know, Jimmy is queering, you know, this this queer black man who's dainty and frail and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But this brother is is Power. just courageous. Is yeah, will speak truth to power. He understands what it means to bear witness. Mm -hmm. He says, we got to make the suffering real. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, in some ways, if you're not angry or rageful mm -hmm. about what's happening in the world and something's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something's off center with your own moral sense about the world. So um, for me, it's always been calibrated. You know, there's there's always this kind of balance between rage and love. And, and you know, uh, Baldwin was the first person I read who gave me license to to be angry as I was invoking love. Because, you know, mm -hmm. I have my, my goatee. It's, it's an homage to Malcolm, right? It's my mm -hmm. first conversion experience. I'll never cut it off. I'll never shave it, right? Mm -hmm. And and so Malcolm gave me a language for my father's rage that was put in me because mm -hmm. he scared, mm -hmm. scared me to death. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. I'm, a, I'm a vulnerable black man, vulnerable yeah, little yeah, boy, yeah. trying to be courageous in public, dealing with daddy issues, right? Jimmy yeah. told me in order to say anything about the world, you got to deal with your interior wounds and your interior mess. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. can't come out here yeah. and just think you can just run your mouth. You got to deal with you. Yes, right? so, yes. And that's the courageous act, right? Yes, absolutely. So, so the short answer to the question, man, is that, you know, I don't, I, you know, my rage doesn't burn hot to where it scorches everyone who comes into my, my, my domain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is clear that um, it's, it's always there. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what, that's what I see with Jimmy too. Oh, before you do that, I just want to mention this because when I'm I'm listening to you talk about uh, Brother Malcolm and his convergence experience, I, it was almost reminiscent of listening to Dr. Cohn speak about his relationship between Dr. King, yeah, and Malcolm, how yeah. he viewed Malcolm as the the, the permission to exercise right. and to right. demonstrate and exuberate his black power. Exactly. But also the love of Dr. King for his people. So I just, I saw and, that while you were speaking. And Brother Elgin, and you know what's so deep too? Is that in his last book, Doc, Cone's last book, he's talking about how Baldwin was the bridge between the two. Yes, yes, right? yes. So he was working on this book on Jimmy, mm. right? Uh, while he, you know, while he, while he, when he got sick, he was working on the book on Jimmy, right? So we don't know when that manuscript is going to make itself known. Man. But but Baldwin is at the heart of it. You know, if Malcolm is the fiery prophet, Baldwin is the fiery poet, right? So, you know, um, so I had to walk with him, man. I had to walk with him because he gives me language, like he gave Toni Morrison language. He yeah. gives me mm. language to see and to describe the world. And when you write about him, you just reach for, you reach, you, re you reach for trying to be a bigger and better writer. Absolutely. But anyway. I don't want to talk too much now. Oh, no, no. No, <laughs> no, no, no. That's we got you on. So my question to you is that for me, looking at it, it seems as though the inception of this book came from... you've Anyone that watches you or has heard you speak or have read your other books can see that you've had Baldwin in the back of your mind for quite some time. Yeah. But... It seems like the inception of this book really, the conception of this book happened after the election of Trump. But the birth of the book happened after you had an opportunity to go visit his historical home in France. Was there some, was there a level of apprehension for you actually starting the book, getting into it? Because at least that's the way I interpreted it. Like, yeah, like this was a journey that you were scared to embark on. Yeah, for a number of reasons, right? So. 
uh, I, when I initially conceived of the book, I thought of it as a kind of biography. Mm. Okay. Um, and it's such a challenge with regards to the archives and 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 getting permissions and and the like that I realized I couldn't write a biography that would that would offer anything new in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I struck up an extraordinary relationship with Carol Weinstein, who was the partner of David Baldwin, Jimmy's mm -hmm. brother, mm -hmm. uh, who helped me kind of see some things that I hadn't seen. And then I realized. I realized as I was, as I was thinking, and I was about a year in, man, after signing the contract, I was like, I'm gonna get these people this money back. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was like, I got to find a, I got to find a frame, right? I gotta think, I gotta figure out how I'm gonna write this book. And then I said, you know, um, I need to, I need to write with Jimmy about the moment. And. And that's going to require me to risk myself a little bit. Hmm. And so then the book started coming together in these moments. And then I remember, because the book is trying to do some things at the level of form in terms of the way in which I'm moving from biography to literary criticism to cultural criticism. And I remember when I gave the first four chapters to Michael Thelwell, because I went and did set with him for a couple of days. And, and he was like, man, I thought you were smart. This, I don't, this don't make no sense. What? This <laughs> It was it was a, it was a humbling experience. He said, "This don't make no sense." And all those double negatives in there, and then so, 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 um, uh, a good friend of mine, Imani Perry, one of my my writing partners, she said, "Write the introduction. Write the introduction." And that's when I sat down to write about the experience in Heidelberg. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly everything fell into place: structure, form. Mm -hmm. Everything fell in because I visited uh, St. Paul de Vance while I was in Heidelberg. And I remember writing, journaling about those, those travels and writing some things. In some ways, what I wrote in the journals actually almost verbatim ended up in the book. And that's when the whole thing, Big O, fell into place, man. The whole, when I wrote that introduction, which accounted for me, you know, going to Nice and, and really you know, seeing the house and seeing where Jimmy, you know, where he, where the creative process worked and, and the place that he eventually called home and was in fact the place where he took his last breath. As I'm reading it, the first time you call him Jimmy, yeah, I had to put the book down for just a moment because what I automatically connected to me is like, oh man, we're getting a personal intimate walk with Dr. here to see from his perspective, also for you to get a better picture of where he is and what he's trying to do here. This like this deep partnership, but this, this one component, this I want you to kind of enlighten or sure, to share sure. a little bit more on. In chapter one, mm -hmm. you state, if what I have called the value gap is the idea that American white lives had always mattered more than the lives of others, then the lie is a broad, powerful architect of false assumptions by which the value gap is maintained. And I had to sit back and just think, man, what the hell does the value gap mean? Mm. And get a better, a, a deeper understanding, because I think there's a lot there. And right. that's one of the things. Share a little bit more about what does that mean? What does it look like? And what? Is, how do we see it? So, so my last book was Democracy and Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul. Yes, and at the heart of that book was this idea of the value gap. We, I said, we talk about the wealth gap. We talk mm -hmm. about the empathy gap and the achievement gap. But the heart of it is the value gap. And what is the value gap? The value gap is the belief that white people matter more than others. And then that belief evidences itself in our social arrangements, our political and economic arrangements, right? And it lives in our habits, right? So this idea that white people matter more than others and advantage and disadvantage, it travels along that valuation, right? And you and you and what follows from it also is just general disregard where you deny certain people dignity and standing because they're not white. Mm -hmm. So the value gap is, is at the heart of this project. It's what, you know, it's what white supremacy, it is how white supremacy um, evidences itself in the world. Mm. In some ways, mm. right? So the lie is, is, is how is the general architecture. It's, it's the way in which it works. So you tell a lie about Black people's capacity. 
Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we don't have we don't have intellectual capacities. We mm -hmm. tell a lie about our passions. You tell a lie about about who we are. Right. You tell a lie about what you've done in the world as if America is a shining city on the hill, a beacon of, of, of light, a beacon light of Redeemer Nation. It mm -hmm. is an example of democracy achieved. You tell a lie about what you've done in the world, what you've done in Haiti, what you've done in Cuba, what you've done in the Philippines, what you've done in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Nagasaki what you've done mm -hmm. here in the United States to native peoples. You tell a, a lie so that you can protect the innocents. And so here this moment on page nine in the text, right? He says, and this comes from a book that Jim, a, 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 an essay Jimmy wrote in 1964 entitled The White Problem. He says, the people who settled the country had a fatal flaw. They could recognize a man when they saw one. They knew he wasn't anything else but a man. Mm. But since they were Christian, and since they had already decided that they came here to establish a free country, the only way to justify the role this chattel was playing in one's life was to say that he was not a man. <laughs> For if he wasn't, then no crime had been committed. Now check this line out. He says, that lie is the basis of our present trouble. That lie is the basis of our present trouble. So you, you have to justify, it's like John Adams telling King George, we will not be your Negroes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Damn, at the very moment in which you give voice to a, vo a notion of freedom, it's predicated on an intimate understanding of unfreedom. Yeah. And you have to lie about that. And so that's what I mean. That's how it functions. And we hear it right now. Check it out. So in the moment in which the country is about to, we are on a cusp of transformation. Yeah. What are you hearing? Monuments, heritage, a reassertion of who we are as America. Yes. You're hearing the lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the lie malforms anything that threatens to reveal the reality of America's uh, false innocence. That's that's what I mean. And I got that straight out of ball in the rubble. Even King said it at the at the uh, 100th uh, birthday celebration of uh, of uh, Dr. Uh, W. B. Du Bois in New York. Dr. King is engaged in a meditation on that section of Du Bois's 1935 classic, Black Reconstruction. And he's he's de dedicated, he's, he's thinking about that section called the propaganda of history. Mm -hmm. And King says, the in, a, in effect, he says, the American mind has been distorted by, quote, poisonous fog of lies. Poisonous fog of lies. Hmm. <sighs> I saw an interview that you did with Maya Marshall not too long ago. And oh, yeah. during that interview, you told her that you barely survived writing this book. Can you go a little bit more in depth about that? What does that mean that you barely survived writing this book? Yeah, man, Jim, Jim, Jim you know, you leave the storm of, uh, of Trump, the age of Trump and run into the chaos of Jimmy's life. That's a, it's an odd decision in some ways. Um, so I said earlier that what there's this, Jimmy has a, Baldwin has this precondition. Before you can say anything about the world, right, you have to engage in this critical examination of who you are. He believed fundamentally in that Socratic dictum, the unexamined life is not worth living. So I found myself uh, trying to write about the Trump era and instead I was grappling with my daddy. Hmm. Ooh. I was grappling with my own vulnerabilities, you know, that, you know, when I was growing up, he could just look at me and scare the shit out of me. Mm. That I was, that, you know, my brother, my older brother would say, stop looking at him. He wants you to cry. He wants you to cry. And, um, and I would cry. And so I was <sighs> grappling with the fact that, that as a young boy, that I had a kind of fear put in my gut mm. so early. And so every time I sat down to write, I would look up, Doc, and I would see a glass of Jameson right in front of me. And I was throwing them back. Every time I would write a sentence, I was throwing them back and, you know, trying my best. You know, my wife was watching me as I was as I was writing in this manic way, you know, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. trying to finish the book, trying to. And Jimmy was just demanding a kind of honesty. He was forcing me. How can I put this? He was forcing me to deal with the scaffolding of my own lies. What? To before I could say anything. You feel me? I feel you. Wow. wow and wow. so, and so, 
you know, and by the time I got to the end of the book, you know, I'm writing about, you know, how my dad, you know, me and my dad got a great relationship. Now. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, I'm writing about how my dad is calling me to tell me what I should say on television, and, you know, <laughs> and so, you know, and that we telling each other we love each other and that we want to write something together and all of this other stuff. But it was a journey, right? But in order, hmm. but in order to get there, um, I had to, I had to deal with this messiness inside of me, man. I had to deal with the wound and the pain that makes me who I am. And then, but then I, I got this thing though, Doc, that will trip you out, right? I'm used. To, have y'all seen that video footage of Nikki Giovanni and the boy and and, and Baldwin? Talk? Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Yeah. But you know, so Baldwin is demanding all of this honesty, right, from you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can slip into a kind of narcissism. Mm where you just focused on yourself and you got people you love all around you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a moment in that conversation with Nikki Giovanni where Nikki Giovanni tells Jimmy, lie to me. Mm. Yeah. You, 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 you lie to that white man every single day. Lie yeah. to me. Yes, lie indeed. To lie to me. Yeah. yeah. You come home and you let it all out on me and I got to deal with this. Lie to me. So there was, so it was, it was, it was a liberatory moment for me. And because Baldwin was Baldwin had me hemmed up. And uh and I think that's why the writing is so personal. It uh, is. Why why I'm why why I'm risking so much in the text at the level of form and at the level of my interior life. Yeah. It's so. very clear how close this this writing is to you. So uh one of my favorite books, Democracy in Black. Okay. You wrote man, that book man, listen, in 20. Man. Don't get me started. You know how much I, you know how much I did that book. Anyway, Democracy in Black, you wrote that book in 2016 after eight years of the first black president. And many people would argue that this was probably one of the, was a harsh critique of the Obama administration and the Democratic Party and black people's position within the Democratic Party. Yeah. Four years into the Trump administration, knowing now what you know, if you knew it then, would your tone or your critique have been the same when you were writing Democracy in Black? That's a great question. Would the tone would have been the same? I was so angry, you know, because we had, I thought we had fallen for the okie doke. Mm. Um, what I know now. Yeah, I think the tone would have changed a bit. I don't know if the substance of the critique would have changed. You know, uh, I, I, I say and begin again that I made an egregious mistake. You know, Baldwin uh, in 1979, when Jimmy Carter was running against Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. and Carter had betrayed black people, you mm -hmm. know, you had Jesse and, and, and others saying that Carter had turned his back with austerity policies that devastated black communities and the mm -hmm. like. Um, but they knew that they had to buy themselves some time because they knew who this other guy was. Because Ronald Reagan to us was as bad as George Wallace, right? He was you the got governor, it. he was the governor of California when yeah. Panther parties, the Panther Party was brutally uh suppressed and Angela Davis was pursued and the like. So we knew who he was. And so Jimmy said very clearly, sometimes you know, black folk don't have much to vote for, but at least we vote, sometimes we vote just to buy ourselves some time. And and you know, I knew I didn't think white people were gonna elect that dude. <laughs> you and every single one of us. I was like, I got an opening, right? We yeah. have an opening that we can really break the back of Clintonism and its hold on the Democratic Party. Sure. Right. We can really push the Democratic Party left and 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 stop engaging in this um this uh, custodial form of politics where people are giving crumbs and delivering black people like we're cattle chewing cud. Mm. Every, ele every election cycle. And um, I overestimated white people and I should have known better. <laughs> I, and you know what? And I'm not just saying that because I'm on the black po in the black podcast. I say that on national television <laughs> to Nicole Wallace. I overestimated white folks. And I accept that. <clears throat> I accept that critique. I accept that. <clears throat> yeah. So Given the current movement and the current climate now, I think part of the argument or part of the dilemma that we're facing is, at least as it pertains to police reform, yeah. is entrenched in the messaging. 
And I think people are getting befuddled with the messaging. Mm -hmm. Do you find the messaging to be a problem at this point for yourself? Or do you think that this is just a growing pain as we're going through this process? I don't even think it's a growing pain. I think when we hear defund the police, that is a that is a slogan that has been a part of grassroots activism, the justice reinvestment movement. This stuff didn't just show up yesterday. Mm. These are grassroots activists who have been arguing for a different kind of frame around policing uh, for decades, right? So what you got, I think, instead, Doc, is bad faith. So they 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 they're critiquing defund the police. They were critiquing Black Lives Matter just just the other day. Yeah. And then they were critiquing, um, you know, black power. Then they, they were even criticizing freedom now. Yeah. yeah. So the slogan as the kind of object of concern is a red herring, right? It's, it's, a, it's designed to get you to focus on whether or not they're comfortable. Mm, mm. And when you say to someone, well, you know, I can't, mobilize and organize by saying transform the police we want you to redistribute funds for the budget that just doesn't, <laughs> that just doesn't sound right when you try to cheer and organize and chant and the like right but the idea of changing the very frame of how we understand public safety breaking the back of a certain understanding of aggressive policing rooted in law and order and the war on drugs that has led to uh, an expansion of the criminal code and the militarization of, of police. And all of this is a part of police community, uh, uh, our communities being over policed, un over surveilled and under protected, yeah. right? So, you know, my thinking is what we need to do is to not allow them to determine the frame it's mm. like it's like I, you know, I'm I'm not a good boxer. I don't I'm not a good boxer, but if your footwork isn't right, then your opponent is gonna put you in a position where if he pops you, you're gonna fall. Mm. So you gotta avoid being moved about. So what's happening? The moment we find ourselves debating about defund the police, you've already conceded the frame. Wow. Yep. You've already, you're already on their terms. You're already on their turf. So the idea is not to, so, so when Clyburn or, or Nancy Pelosi or somebody says, should, we shouldn't say def defund the police, right? Because what they're thinking is we don't want to be perceived as soft on crime. Yep. And the moment you say that, guess where you are? You right. back to your tough on crime model. Yep. You're caught, you're trapped. So what we got to do when you, we live in a moment where the language we use cannot bear the weight of the reality that we live. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, let me say that again. We live in a moment, and I'm echoing Jimmy here, where the language we use cannot bear the reality we live. Lord have mercy. Oh. Then we have to be the poets mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and give new language, bro. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Feel me? Yeah. Y'all got I'm, I'm all I'm all tired now. Y'all got me up here. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> Coming to work, bro. <laughs> okay. Given the change that we've been seeing, the sea change it appears that we've been seeing in terms of those folks that are out there protesting with members of Black Lives Matter and the like. Do you think the image or the perception maybe? of white allyship is changing? Or do you think this is just what it is for now when then we're gonna fall back into our our normal routine? Well, I don't know yet. You know, I don't wanna prejudge it. It looks different. You got, a, you got a generation of folk, millennials and GZers who, Gen Zers who think that the whole thing is broken. Throw it all away, yeah. uh, And some of them are going to the, to the fascist side. Some of them are going to the progressive side, but they know that the thing is broken, right? Sure. So there's that. But you never know, you know? Um, we have to see what it all makes, what, what this moment makes of us. But I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I must admit, there are moments when I'm skeptical. I went back and reread Du Bois' short story in, in Dark Water, The Comet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And The Comet is a fascinating short story. I think it was written in 1920. Uh, a comet hits New York and kills basically everybody, and leaves a white woman and a black man together. Uh, and they're initially skeptical, but then they realize 
uh, that their self, you know, that their their safety, their salvation depends upon each other. So they, there's a moment where they look past the fact of their whiteness and blackness, and they and they try to survive. But the moment, the moment there's an intrusion of normalcy, mm. where the white woman's husband shows up, uh oh, everything returns to what it was. So Baldwin in that short story is trying to tell us that disaster can create a moment, a moment of solidarity. But this system is so, is so dastardly. It's so complex. So I read it and I said, Lord, let me go pour myself a James. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you're drinking that black barrel. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> Rather, let me go pour myself a James. Hey, hey, Doc, the election's coming. Yeah. Black folks are in a state of rage, frustration, and every other day with some foolishness from one of these two cats, confusion is just all over the place. Insight, what should we be looking for? What we should be trying to avoid? Uh, anything that you can share in regards to the upcoming election. I remember seeing a clip of yours a couple of years ago and I didn't see the full context of the conversation, so I'm not going to use that at this moment, but you mentioned voting down ballot. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's something that I've seen other organizations uh, mention in regards to this current election. Give us your thoughts on the election. What the hell should we be avoiding? <laughs> Any type of insight that, that, that you could offer? Because we are very, very frustrated and angry currently. Yeah, you know, you have some groups out there, ADOS and others, or ADOS, out there. ADOS, ADOS sure. they're out there, you know, taking up my blank out campaign in this moment. You know, uh, I, I in 2016, when before Donald Trump was the nominee, I was arguing that if the Democratic Party came at us, we just simply hot sauce in a purse. Um, no, that was <laughs> If the Democratic Party didn't put forward, you know, a robust agenda to address the specifics of our conditions coming out of the Great Recession, then we should just leave the presidential ballot blank and vote vote down ballot. You know, I've already said that, you know, I should have I should have known better uh, in terms of, of what 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 white voters were capable of. Um, in this moment, what we have to do is walk in and chew gum at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. We have. To we have to get Donald Trump out of office. I think that's clear. I don't know if the nation can survive another four years mm. of this man in the White House. And I'm talking at the level of institutions, not just simply at the level of policy, right? I don't sure. know if the nation mm. can survive because mm. uh, the institutional erosion is so is so fundamental right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think we also need to vote down ballot in, in extraordinary ways, right? We need to, because we know that, you know, police ref Tr the transformation of policing in this country is not going to happen in D.C. It's going to happen in your local cities. It's going to happen right. in your local counties. It's going to happen at the state level. Um, so we need to begin to assert our political our political might, our political authority, by turning out without Barack Obama on 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 the ballot, turning out in historic numbers, um, and and having an impact uh, across the board. Uh, in terms of, uh, of of the electoral process, but we also need to understand that, and I said this in Democracy in Black, and I still believe this: that voting is the last thing you do. Yeah, yeah, you did. Mm. It's not yeah. the only thing you do. Mm -hmm. It's the last thing you do, and and if any moment proves that point, it's our current moment. Yeah, because we all thought that many of us thought Black Lives Matter had dispersed, that it wasn't doing, that the organizations underneath that slogan was they weren't doing that work. And what we know right now on the ground is that activists, organizers have been doing work un, in the cut for yeah. decades since two, you know from two thousand you know since Mike Brown they've been doing this work yeah. and and so um, what what a robust understanding of democratic citizenship entails is that you know we're doing work uh, every single day trying to build a more just uh, community, a more just America. So. That's what I. That's what I think, Doc. Hey, bro. Listen. Thank you. We're, we know that you've got a lot of other appointments to make, so we're going to get you out on this question. Given your literature, given the appearances on MSNBC, you've become once again one of the most notable faces in Black academia. People look towards you when incidences like these that we're seeing now arise. Does that become tiring at all? 
to have that weight, not just the weight of black people and their expectations, but also the weight of society on you to be able to help make sense of it or where we don't make sense of it, where we can't make sense of it. Yes. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you, you know, and you always got to get, you always got to be asking yourself the question, you know, right. Um, why are you doing this? Mm. Can't get caught up in your own brand. Can't get caught up in your own voice. Yeah. Right. And you just got to, you just got to remember, you know, in those moments, you know, what, what's your task? Okay, bear witness. Make mm. the suffering real. Hmm. Tell the truth. Straight no chase. Tell the truth with a smile. Show angry. Show anger. Bear your teeth when necessary. Right? Leverage this platform in order to speak for the least of these. Don't get caught up in all of the, all of the accolades and all of this stuff. Uh, you know, as as the moment. My mama, I'm a country boy from Mississippi, man. So my mama uh, tells me all the time, the reason people want to listen to you is because they know you're telling the truth. And the moment you stop telling the truth, they won't listen to you. So, you know, what What am I to do in the short time that I have? Bear witness. Bear witness. We all got to be poets, bro. Mm. <sighs> the book is Begin Again, James Baldwin's America. Um, Professor Glaude, I can't say thank you enough. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time out to be on the show. I hope you won't be a stranger. I know Nicole Wallace is going to keep you most of the time. No, nah, ever... y'all got me, Doc. This has been amazing. We got to we got to chop it up again. So this is this no is beautiful, Doc. Thank you so much, sir. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Doc. Appreciate, appreciate you. Take care. Thank Doc. you, sir. Bro. Yes, sir. Bro, L Boogie. Where can people find you if they want to find you, man? Well, here in a few minutes, bro, I'm going to be sitting on this floor tearing like the old church folk, bro. Because <laughs> <laughs> that word that I just received. Uh, no doubt. I know, I know we want to close out, man, but I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't share just a, a, a brief reflection of what we just experienced, man. Uh, because for me, oh, it was bigger than having a a celebrity guest come on uh i've always looked at dr cloud as such a powerful black male voice who always speaks truth to power in reading his books man this discussion was nothing short of transformative for me particularly mm -hmm. when he started talking about hope because you know in our conversations that's that's one of the things that I'm I'm constantly like, yo, bro, yeah. where are you finding hope at? I ain't got no more hope left, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that that I'm gonna listen to this over and over again, particularly that part where he's talking about hope and finding strength in the rubble. That to me are some of the key things, man, that stood out. I'm so thankful for this opportunity, man. What were some of your thoughts? And then we'll close out because I'm hungry and I know you haven't eaten and you got to add the juice and berries to your throat. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. Because you know the bonnet is going to be straight on once the camera goes off. Uh, for me, I was really in awe of his description of Baldwin. Like I said, the reading the book, you can really tell that this was a labor of love is not just something that he did just to pick up a check yeah, the yeah. proper the time period that it's taken him to write this book he's been writing this book well, yeah. since tw yeah. 2016 yeah. trying to get this thing together and once again i mean in this age there is kind of a thirst for Baldwin, you know, with Bill Street and talk and I'm not your nigger and so on, but to choose Baldwin as the lens to look through or to look at America through, especially given the context that we're talking about hope and you have in Baldwin someone who was so disgruntled and so disappointed in America that he left and went to go live in France. It just seemed it was more than interesting. And to hear him actually explain it and especially the battles that we have within ourselves before we can actually what? rectify our situation. Man, 
Uh, yeah, we were blessed. We were blessed tonight, man, and we really appreciate black it. Black men battling with the internal before they're able to do the external was, again, part of the conversations you and, and many other black men we've had together, how we are working on the, ex, the internal part of ourselves, dealing with our trauma in order to directly build a legacy for our family and how hard a battle that was. So yeah. Yeah, I, I, listen, bro. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna give the the folks a little bit of insider baseball. Whenever L and I have conversations, we typically don't just say, "Hey, what's going on, my dude? How you doing?" We say, "What are your three feelings today? How are you? What are your three emotions that you're dealing with?" Yeah. And that's that routine that we've built in our conversations has been cathartic for me. Incredible, helpful, bro. It's to be able to maneuver through all of these emotions. And not only to deal with those emotions, but then also to deal with the interpersonal relationships that that are affecting, or these emotions are affecting. It's yeah, it's 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 a bit much, yeah. and I know many brothers are dealing with the same thing. So I don't want to make it seem like this is unique to us, but yeah, heavy as the head, man. But hey, where can they find us at, bro? Yes, indeed, El Boogie. Where can they find you if they'd like to find you, man? And uh. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Elgin Bailey. Uh, I would love to hear from you, man. I'd love to chop it up with you. Come through. Let's talk about some things. No doubt. And I'm big. Oh, Mr. In the Black himself. You can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at MR underscore in the black. And I want to thank you for joining us for another incredible episode of the In the Black podcast. Remember, we want to hear from you. Help us continue these conversations by reaching us at in the black. PDCST on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And as always, informed, intelligent, in, in the, the black. black. Peace. <laughs>